time for another set of practice positions. I decided to take a little bit of the randomness out of it or add randomness. We're going to we're going to actually access the key positions on chess.com through the computer trainer rather than going directly to the drills, uh, which is actually letting it's a little bit harder to see what position you have coming up. So when we start and go for our key position, uh, these are all the ones I've already completed myself. So Rook and Pawn Basics, mating with a queen, right? Good job, Dan. Uh, defending the Unsound Sacrifice, and, and um, as you, I, I believe all of you actually saw me defend the Unsound Sacrifice. If you remember, this was from the previous position where I didn't really defend it successfully. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get technical, so we're going to work our way down this list and challenge ourselves to, to uh, get, get uh, better at, at both technique and calculation. I, I like the fact that the computer player, the computer coach, really challenges you. So let's go ahead and choose uh, any random one. We don't necessarily have to do them in order. I don't, uh, let's see, let's, let's do bishop versus knight where I'm up a pawn in the end game. This, this is going to be tough. Uh, so I think, that, I think that this one here is, is really challenging as far as technique goes. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and bring up our, our score sheet so you can all follow along at home and see whether or not I'm finding the best moves or not. And let's develop a plan. One of the other advantages of this position is clearly that he has a few pawns stuck on light squares, right? So I have a light square bishop. We have a target on h7 and potential targets on c6 and d5. So bishop to d3 seems like the best move to start. It will both sort of limit the king's quick entry into the game by hitting h7 and maybe prevent this move 94 check because in a lot of lines I might be able to just bishop takes, pawn takes, king f4. So one of the, one of the key things to having good technique, and this is an important piece of advice if you want to take note of it, every once in a while you know, I black out and actually say something useful. Uh, and remember my days of teaching professionally for 15 years before I became an idiot on chess TV. Uh, one of the most useful things in technique, seriously, is to always have an eye on the next position that could come, the future transition. So what that means is if you're in a rook ending, if the rooks get traded right now, who's winning in the king and pawn ending and why? If you're in a minor piece ending, if the pieces get traded, who's winning and why? And constantly being aware of whether or not the exchanges will favor you or not favor you. And obviously in a simple position like this where I'm up a pawn against a strong computer, right? We know it's stockfish, probably about 2,900, 3,000 strength. Um, I'm obviously happy to play bishop b3. Anything that prevents complications by the computer because I know I can simplify into the winning king and pawn ending. Uh, so bishop d3 seems like a no-brainer, but let's take the next steps and see the deeper plan. And remember that tip about always recognizing whether or not exchanges help you because in more complex situations, not taking the time to acknowledge that or to be prepared, right? You're not, you're not really playing with accountability to yourself because then if something complicated happens under time pressure and you make a trade, you may have worse your advantage, maybe sometimes blown in. If you're the defender, you may be trading into a lost endgame. So always be aware of whether or not the exchanges in the position favor you, increase your advantage slash defensive opportunities, or hurt you. Just it's always be aware. Mental checklist. So bishop d3, if king g7. The other thing I start to look at is b3. I don't really want to trade off the weak pawns on the light squares, but um, I do want to open up the position and give myself a target. Honestly, once I played bishop d3, is it seems that king activation into e5 would be very hard to stop once he has pieces committed to the h7 pawn. So bishop d3 is the first ideal placement. Prepare to enter with the king. And let's say bishop d3, king g7, king f4, knight f7. That seems like the ideal defense for him. He's blocking king e5. Once he's committed the knight to f7... One idea there is bishop into f5 with the threat of possibly bishop d7, which would then force knight to d8. And then I might be able to enter with king e5, king g6, um, bishop f5 check, because I'd still be willing to trade, especially with my king there. And that would be kind of nice. So I, I feel like that's a winning plan. And I'm going to go for it. It's time to risk it and go get that biscuit. So let's, let's prepare to enter with our king into e5. I'm anticipating knight f7. 
The other plan is, and probably why the computer initially said bishop d3 wasn't an accuracy, though I don't really care what it thinks, um, is that the bishop is on this diagonal, of course, I would immediately be able to go to d7 here, right? And that's why I like bishop f5. Uh, the other way to get there is to bring the bishop around the long ways, but it doesn't seem to have any real advantages attacking it from b7 versus d7, and from d7 I can come back to this diagonal. So, <clears throat> okay, and this all seems good, but... Okay, let's not be inaccurate. You have to calculate and have bigger picture thinking in mind. So bigger picture thinking in mind, I'm doing well. I have an active king, a well-placed bishop, I'm up a pawn. Accuracy says bishop f5. Okay, I need to at least come up with his next move. If bishop f5, if h6, if he tries to eliminate the pawn, pawn takes. If knight takes, bishop d7 is just lights out. If king takes, bishop d7, knight d8, king e5, king g5, king d6, king f4, Bishop takes d5, king e4, king to c5. Uh, he has knight e6 check there, actually. If uh, if king e4, I can take on d5, and then he takes d4. I'm up two pawns in that position. And actually, his knight is trapped, so that's not really an option for the computer. So bishop f5 seems more and more difficult for black to deal with. Putting his knight on d8 is just, is just not something that black really wants. Okay, now that move makes sense sort of bluffing at the idea that he, that uh, maybe he'll play knight g6 and allow the king upon ending, but I doubt it. I think he just recognizes that passive defense is not going to work here. So if bishop d7, knight g6 check, king g4, knight e7 is the follow-up that's going to guard that pawn. Um, bishop d7, knight g6 check, king f5. If king f7, I can't take c6, because knight e7 check, king e5, knight takes, king takes, although that might be a fun and interesting way to play. Now, I, th I think I need to come up with another move here, like a little bit of a high-class waiting move. Um, put black in a tough position where he's not able to reroute the knight to that ideal ideal uh, square. I like that. I like that move there, because getting the knight to e7 would allow black to both hold c6 and keep the king at bay with f5, right? So the approach I took made it a little bit harder for him. And now there's a few options, right? Because he's really stuck. I mean, the, the position is, is really stuck for him. King e5, king g6, king d6, king takes, king e7, knight b7, bishop takes, knight moves, bishop takes. It seems real rough for him. I'm going to anticipate on king e5 that he actually plays knight f7 check. And just goes for the position, yeah, where he wins that pawn. Um, he's gonna he's gonna try to get the position where he's gonna win that pawn. But now I've I've also managed to improve. I've also managed to improve my king position. You see what just happened there, right? A little bit of a triangulation, king e5, king e7. Now bishop e8 comes to mind as a move to kind of put him in a further zugzwang. But he can just move to f8 or f7. So it's not really ideal for me. So let's advance these pawns and enjoy the fact that we can really sit on this position here. Now he doesn't have knight f7 anymore. So now we can come to e5. He's taken away his own square for the knight, which is going to allow us to come back to targeting h7. And now... Pushing the h-pawn is going to allow g6, is it not? Wow, he, he must have calculated that faster than I did, but I still, it still seems sort of unwise for black. Huh. Okay, so counterplay. Black is getting some counterplay here. So if, if king to g4, king f6, king h5 takes g7, he loses. So king h5 has to be met by king to g7. And then I can play bishop d7, knight e4 takes, knight takes c3. Wow, this is why the computer is tough. It felt like this would be exactly the kind of principle to weaknesses situation that would just give white an easy road to victory with this extra pawn when I first considered the idea. 
but now I'm actually regretting my decision already. Which might be a little premature. I'm not sure I really need to regret it just yet. I just need to be more patient. Hmm. g7, king f7, bishop in, knight e4, bishop takes, knight takes, you know, a4, king takes, a5, I mean, seems that that, that, that even... So, so what ends up being tricky, both in the teaching situation and, and in a real game, is you, you can't allow yourself to convert only on intuition. A lot of times people, once they're better, they feel like the win should just sort of happen naturally. And so they go for the safe lines. They're sort of intuitively, everyone wants to win like a boa constrictor, where they're just strangling their opponent to death and there's very little life or opportunities. But... Against good defense, you almost never have the option to win like a boa constrictor from start to finish. At some point, your opponent puts pressure on you to really calculate and go for a risky line. A line that isn't necessarily risky. Okay, I'm up two and a half points here, but, but without proper calculation, you could be letting your opponent back into the game. And, and so, watch for that in your own games. If you feel like you're not converting on advantages, it might be partly because you're trying to win like a boa constrictor instead of seizing the critical moment to really calculate. So if this were a real tournament game, you'd see me like this right now. Like, you know, every once in a while you see a picture of me like that on the internet, even though I don't really focus anymore. No, uh, but that's what you need to do right now is I need to calculate. I need to calculate some winning lines. I mean, so for example, g7, king of seven, bishop d7, if king takes g7, bishop takes c6, knight e4, a nice trick there, I believe, is c4, because the pawn can't take it, the knight hangs. So if g7, king of 7, bishop d7, knight e4 right away, I can also play c4. Uh, he might move the knight to somewhere like c3, and then if I play c5, he takes. You know what, I even have like b5 there, and just rolling it, takes, and then c6. And so that's an example of like a super risky line, right? At the end of a line like that, I might be down a couple pawns, but I could be queening. But, it, you know, you're not converting the position in a boa constrictor fashion. You're having to calculate. So let's see. So if g7, king of 7, bishop d7, if he just takes g7 and I take, I think he's just lost. Because if I pick up the d5 for free, now I'm up. Now I've got all these pawns together. The bishop is in an open board. I'm guarding the h pawn from queening, so I can sort of intuitively, safely say I'm going to win that without going much further in the concrete calculation. But if g7, king of seven, bishop d7, knight e4, um, g7, king of seven, bishop d7, knight e4. If I play c4 immediately, okay, knight f6 would gain a tempo on the bishop, but bishop takes c6 seems fine. Uh, d takes c4, although maybe it's not fine. Ooh. D takes C4. I've given him a passed pawn. So actually, it's very dangerous, in fact. So if bishop, if G7, king of 7, bishop D7, knight E4, bishop takes, knight takes C3, A4. That might be my critical line. If he moves the knight to E2 check, I play king E3 or king E5. And I'm, I'm basically just trying to roll the pawns here. I'm trying to play B4 and then A5 and then B5. I just try to get a queen before he has the opportunity to deal with both the G7 pawn and the queen side. And again, it, I, it's a combination of intuition here because, I, I mean, one of the I can't imagine how hard these conversion positions would be with a clock. We need to get a clock on this, right? That would be a great feature request. Hashtag Danny, write that down, right? Because this whole thing here, okay, it wouldn't be as instructive and I wouldn't have these opportunities to discuss this with you, but the whole thing would be much more challenging to try to convert this with less time against really accurate defense. A computer defends much more accurately than a human. By the way, so king e5 just doesn't work as of knight f3 check, and then he rinses and repeats, right? And I don't like shampoo. So, not now. So my other options, again, back to king g4, king f6, king h5, king g7. I sit, but he sits too. Like, that's really irritating, actually. And, and I don't, 
I feel like the time has come to to play for the queen side and understand that that position with the bishop on c6 hitting d5 makes the knight crippled. I can guard all my pawns and advance them. And the h pawn is still held in check by the king. So, okay, I don't know <clears throat> what's going on here um, 100%, but I'm trusting a combination of my calculation and my intuit. Okay, so he didn't go for that like we thought, So, but I can't play c4 because of knight f6. That's sort of key little trick. So it's time to take. I'm not even looking at the computer's evaluation right now on the broadcast because it just it's about converting on my advantage now and not really getting caught up in second guessing myself because I feel confident that this is a winning end game. Now a question after he takes g7 is do I do I play a5, king f6? b5, king e6, b6, takes, a6 is winning on the spot. So if a5, king f6, b5, king e6, b6, takes, a6, he can't stop, he can't stop the pawn. Bishop's advantage over the knight is clear there. The reason why I'm calculating that is because the other way to go here is king e5, right? And try to prevent king f6 and then not come back till I have to, like king e5, h5, a5, h4, and then king there. Maybe kind of gain a tempo in a weird way, but I, I don't think so. It feels off. feels like if a5, the other way he may consider playing is a6. If a5, a6, though, I think I can just push b5. Yeah, so he can't go for that. I'm not even going to look at what the computer thinks because I think I'm winning with this line. I really do. Okay, now he goes there, but that's going to allow me to push b6 and force the knight to sacrifice. And it's because of that line I calculated. King e6, b6, takes a6. Because now I have two options. One is bishop takes d5. The other is b6. Um, if b6 takes, I can't play a6 because then he can push b5. Um, but if b6 takes, you know, I take his knight, he takes... So I guess the question is why rush it, right? I guess I guess I'm going to be able to force him to give up his knight anyway at this point it would seem. If b6 pawn takes, bishop takes, pawn takes a5, that that could be a little bit irritating. He's got the two pawns for the bishop. That may not be easily winning. So bishop takes d5 seems like the way to go. Okay, now bishop b3. If bishop b3 here, knight to c3 is the only move. b6 takes. If bishop b3, knight c3, then bishop to c4. That, that's not easy for him. But why, why even worry about cutting off the knight right now? I feel like maybe the proper thing to do is to just activate this king to make sure that I can hold everything. Yeah, that seems accurate by him. That seems accurate by the computer. So now if b6 takes a6, b5, a7, knight b6, queen, takes, takes. Now he's only got the one pawn, and so it should be winning. I'm going to go for that. I don't know. But I think that's winning. And there may be, there may have been other ways to just sit on the position. Of, you know, of course there were. But I think this is the most accurate thing to do. Go get the piece. No way, I'm still not I'm not still winning here. Yeah, of course I'm still winning here. My king can stop the H pawn. Again, 
not the best technique maybe but this was the this was what I calculated as winning and so went for it once a human sees a winning line human goes for the winning line regardless of whether it seems like the cutest way to win or not according to the computer that's life that's life in the big city of man versus machine I think I got this one. All right, yep. Evaluation confirms it is over. Man, you could just see how nervous I was about all that, right? I mean, seriously. The computer just makes you so nervous. It really challenges your technique. You know why probably a lot of people won't do the practice drills things I'm doing? Because they don't want to, because it's hard. I mean, honestly, like failing to win against a computer is really frustrating when you're winning because the comp it just it like when I did when I won that or when I didn't win that bad sacrifice in the previous practice drills, I was frustrated. I mean, that's the truth. Um, but in the end, um, you're getting better as a chess player, forcing yourself to to have more accurate technique because the computer will take nothing less. It will it will accept nothing less than incredibly accurate technique. So that's the truth. Okay, now we just need the computer to play a little faster so we can wrap up this latest episode of Practice Drills, Man versus Machine, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And it is over. But does the computer ever resign? I don't even know if it does. It's announcing mate in 11 right now. Let's see if I can find... Most accurate mate. Yep, I did it. And finally, a successful practice drill session. Thank you to all of you for watching. Go ahead and uh, tell your friends about this video series. I think it's one of the more instructional things we're doing. Not as exciting or sexy as chess rivals or live blitz commentary, but instructive nonetheless. And uh, thanks everybody. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye now.